Um, I'm, I'm fascinated by this, this figure of Ashoka. He's the first individual clear voice to come out of India that we can identify coming from a particular personality. And um, in the book I call it Ashoka's song. It comes through loud and clear and this song extends beyond India's borders. His message reaches right through Asia and it resonates through two millennia and a half. I mean, he is a very strong, powerful voice. Yes, before that we have had writers like Chanakya, who's writing about political history, but in a sense, that's not a personal series of statements. What Ashoka does when he writes up his famous edicts, these are personal statements. Uh, and from that you get a real sense of the man. And he's the first great ruler in history who admits He's got things wrong. I love him for that. He says, I've made a horrible mistake. I've invaded this country of Kalinga. I killed thousands of people. I've taken, enslaved so many thousands. I've made widows and orphans. And I, I'm sorry, I've got it wrong. And I'm going to try and put it right. Can you imagine a politician saying that? Um, so I admire him for that enormously. And then, of course, there's the other, there are little, little personal things that he says. But I think more importantly than the personal things is that again he's he breaks all the rules I can think of no other ruler in history who stood up and said I want all religions to be respected I want every man to love their neighbor I do not I am no longer going to conquer by violence I'm going to conquer only by moral force he warns his neighbors, if you go down to the south, in, 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 uh, on the edge of his empire, he's the first Indian and the only Indian ruler who's managed to conquer the entire subcontinent, including what we now regard as Afghanistan and, and Pakistan. Um, but he stops just short of, of, of uh, Cape Comorin and the, and the deep south. And he says, I'm not going any further. And he tells his neighbors, extraordinarily, to me, it's extraordinary, I, I'm not going any further. Uh, believe me, I have no plans to conquer you. I will only conquer you by moral force, by my ideas, by my religious ideas. And he calls this word dharma. And he redefines dharma. Uh, it's not Buddhist dharma, as people think. It's, it's a dharma that draws on three great traditions within India, uh, Hinduism, Jainism, and Buddhism. And he never uses the word God, he never uses the word Buddha. He asked everybody to respect all religions. And this extraordinary message of non-violence. No other ruler in history, to my knowledge, has ever said, we're going to have no killing. We'll all be vegetarians. We must love another, each other. I mean, I suppose uh, some Christians would say, this is what Jesus said. But I don't think Jesus was a vegetarian. And I don't think he ever said, uh, I'm going to be non-violent. So we have this extraordinary ruler who comes forward with this extraordinary message. And um, that really is, is what excites me about writing about this man, Ashoka. But the other thing, uh, which is the sad part of the story, is that, that that voice, which is so strong, and which has such an effect on Asia, because Ashoka is the man who picks up a small sect and turns it into a world religion. And I'm talking about Buddhism. Before Ashoka came along, Buddhism was just one of a number of minor sects, really un insignificant. And it's Ashoka who falls in love with Buddhism and, and, and picks it up and runs with it. And so w w we can thank him for that. Um, but the other thing is that Ashoka, by adopting himself, by becoming a Buddhist, I should stop there a second and just draw a distinction between the Ashoka who puts up the edicts and the Ashoka who calls himself a Buddhist. On his very f earliest uh, series of edicts, they're called the Lesser rock, uh, rock Edicts, he says, I have been an Upasaka, I am a follower of the Buddha. He never used that expression again. When he writes his much more important uh, major rock edicts, he never uses the word uh, Buddhism again because he wants his religion to be for all people. But he makes the mistake of giving all his money towards Buddhism. He starts a program of spreading the relics of the Buddha all across India. 
and he antagonizes the Brahmins and uh, he challenges Brahmin orthodoxy and by doing that in a sense he signifies the death warrant of his ideas because he was on a collision course with Brahminism um, and, and that really is fatal. There's some kind of, we never quite know what happens at the end of Ashoka's life. There seems to have been some kind of palace takeover. And he seems to be, um, he dies in isolation, he dies in misery, and very quickly the Mauryans collapse, uh, Brahmin orthodoxy takes over again, and Ashoka is wiped out of the religious history of India. For 2,000 years, his voice is lost, and it's only in the 19th century, when, with the rediscovery of the Ashokan edicts and the Ashokan boulders with the inscriptions, and the translation of that language, that first language, that we rediscover Buddha and we rediscover Ashoka. And it's, it's a great pleasure to me that when India became independent, that uh, when Nehru was looking for some unifying figure, he turned back to Ashoka and he said, here is a man that all religions of India can identify with. And so we will have Ashoka's symbols as our symbols, the symbol of the, of the chakra, which is a Buddhist symbol, but also Ashoka's symbol of the four lions. And so Ashoka becomes very important in secular India. And it's really nice now that Indians can accept Ashoka as part of their heritage after he'd been lost for 2,000 years. Uh, later on, I'm going to be talking with Raj Mohan Gandhi, who's written a wonderful biography of, of the Mahatma Gandhi. And uh, he is very, very lucky because he has too many sources. Uh, I had the opposite. I had very few sources because uh, what do we have? What do we know about Ashoka? We have his rock edicts, we have his pillar edicts, but they're limited, limited in scope. Um, if you look at the, uh, what you might call the, the classical Hindu sources, Ashoka is not mentioned. He only appears in lists of uh, genealogies in the Puranas. In the Purana, it lists all the Mauryan rulers, Chandragupta, Bindusara, Ashoka. And that's the only reference within what you might call Hindu history. So where has he gone? Well, luckily, outside India, uh, there are other sources in Sri Lanka, there are the very ancient chronicles of the island. Uh, one's called the Mahavamsa, the, the great island chronicle. And there was rediscovered in the 1830s a full story of the Buddha. Similarly in Tibet, uh, again another Buddhist country outside India, there, are, there was also rediscovered in the 19th century um, the Ashoka Vedana, the story uh, of, 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 of Ashoka. So there are these sources from two different Buddhist traditions. And they contradict each other. They tell different stories. But you bring that all together, and then you add one more element, which is archaeology. And so slowly, slowly, we are rediscovering Ashoka as we rediscover India's early history. You remember we only discovered that India was such an ancient civilization with Harappa and Mahenjo-daro in the 1920s. I know, and, uh, and continually we realize, as we look at that history, how wrong we were about Mahenjo-daro and, and Harappa. I would prefer to call it the Saraswati civilization, but um, many would disagree with me. So uh, history is constantly rediscovering itself, and I think there's a lot more, I hope, will come out of the ground to, to teach us about Ashoka and those early days. Well, there's... Uh, um, there's been a marvelous biography uh, uh, written by India's greatest historian, I would, I would claim Professor Romila Tapa. But that was written 40 years ago, and a lot has been done since. There have been more discoveries, we found more rock edicts, uh, we found, obviously, there's more evidence of, of Ashoka. For instance, 100 miles west of... Uh, Anyway, in Andhra Pradesh, there's a, a new stupa has been discovered, which one day, when it's been restored, will be as great, perhaps, as, as Sanchi. It will be a national uh, treasure. Uh, this is at a place called Kanagalahari, Hani. And there is a wonderful drawing of a wonderful rock um, bas relief of Emperor Ashoka. And it's written Ashok on top, Ashoka Rayo. 
And so gradually, gradually, we are discovering images of Ashoka uh, this, and how, how much he was held in respect by the Satavahanas who ruled central India for two and a half centuries in the very early, very early days. And so gradually, gradually, we are learning more about Ashoka. And so he's, he's, uh, that process will continue, hopefully. Um, it's very fascinating. Uh, in southern Karnataka and um, just on the edge of north Tamil Nadu, there is a great pocket of Ashokan inscriptions, none of which were known about uh, 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 previous to the last century, let's say. Um, and I think the first one was discovered... Um, anyway, there's a pocket of them, about 20 uh, minor rock edicts and one uh, major rock edict, which shows that that area must have been a very strong uh, supporter of, of Ashoka at that time. Uh, nothing further south, uh, but that, that ties up because Ashoka never went to the deep south. So it's, it's, uh, and it's, it's nice to know that it isn't just a northern phenomenon. Um, Ashoka spreads himself right down to the south, and uh, um, as I say, archaeology is going to be the key. It's very interesting to remember, as I say, um, Buddhism disappeared in India. Not, may I quickly say, because of Muslim iconoclasm, not essentially because of Hindu uh, uh, iconoclasm or, or, or um, violence, but because it had become so esoteric, so tantric, that it really wasn't becoming a popular religion. It petered out, but it survived in different forms, north, south, and east of us. Um, East, yes, but it, and you, as, you, as you will know that with the advance of Islam, the Buddhist country of uh, Gandhara, Afghanistan today, that was completely um, destroyed by the advance of Islam. It's a fact, we can't, we can't escape that. But nevertheless, within, in, in, in India, it had already more or less disappeared. Uh, and you, know, uh, you will know that uh, tragically, the last, almost the last gasp of India was the destruction by Muhammad Bhaktiar of uh, Nalanda. Uh, uh, the great monastery from, to which for centuries people had come from all over, from China, from Tibet, from uh, Indonesia to study and to learn about Indian culture as well as Hindu Buddhism. So that, that alas, all that, all that disappeared. And so there's no trace, very little trace of Buddhism within India today. But of course it survives, as I say, to the north, to the east and to the south. And it's there that we realize how important Ashoka was uh, to South Asia and indeed to East Asia and to North Asia. Uh, and so that, uh, you may well find that a Mongol in Mongolia is more aware of Ashoka as one of the great um, bodhisattvas of Buddhism than people do in India today. It's very interesting because it's from, uh, it's from Ashoka that we know how, how within a hundred years of, of the death of the Buddha, uh, Buddhism was splitting into thousands of, uh, not thousands, 16 major factions. And one of Ashoka's actions is to call a council, and he does it in Pataliputra, which we know, of course, as Patna. And he built there the first great council chamber in stone that India has ever had. There was a magnificent uh, pillared hall there, which alas was destroyed and has sunk now beneath the earth. And now there's just a great pit there. Uh, it was excavated um, by Mukherjee, uh, by Spooner at the turn of the century, and they found only the base of this great pillared hall. They found a magnificent series of steps down to the river. And that is the place where all the Buddhists came to confer. And Ashoka said, basically, sort yourselves out, you guys. He was strong enough to say, make up your minds, what is Buddhism? And one group won, this one group, and said, right. Ashoka says, right, we are now going to preach this version of Buddhism. And that really is the moment when Mahayana Buddhism splits from Theravada Buddhism, and you get the north-south divide. And one group turns towards Pali, one group continues in Sanskrit. And uh, that, of course, is the great basis of the great major split within Buddhism between the two schools, the north school and the south school. Um, and there is the evidence, there is that evidence in Pataliputra. Unfortunately, it's 25 feet underground and there's nothing to see. I'd love it if young people could particularly 
learn to study Ashoka, not simply in terms of his, of his, of his uh, edicts, but in terms of the man and what he stood for, and how important that was in, in laying the foundations of the, dare I say it, the morality of Bharat, the idea of ahimsa, non-violence, the idea of vegetarianism, the idea of tolerance. These are wonderful virtues that we associate with India. Now, they didn't begin with Mahatma Gandhi, bless him. They began much, much earlier, two and a half thousand years ago with Ashoka. Remember that.